Oh. And we're live. Hello and welcome everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to the perform uh, performance marketing track and welcome to the session. No cookies, no problem. Leveraging an integrated email strategy in a world without third party cookies. We were just talking uh, offline with the host of uh, our relationships with cookie. It's a hate and love relationship, let's say. <laughs> Very happy to have with me Lorna. Uh, noon she's email and marketing automation specialist at wolfgang digital and uh, brendan uh, almack he's the md for uh, ireland's largest independent digital agency wolfgang digital as well uh, so we will take the questions at the very end so make sure you drop them in the q a tab or in the chat and with that i leave the stage to my speakers brilliant thanks a million ines um, I'll just share my screen now. Hi, everyone. Thanks a million for joining us. I'm delighted to be speaking to you this morning, um, where, wherever you are. Um, as Inez said, my name is Brendan. I'm joined by my, my colleague, Lorna. We're from Wolfgang Digital, uh, based here in Dublin, Ireland. And we're a, a performance marketing uh, agency specializing in retail and, and lead gen, actually. Um, we've been working quite hard over the last year and a half, trying to get our clients ready for what we believe is the, the new era of digital marketing. Um, so really excited to share where we are with that um, over the next few minutes. I'm gonna give you a high level view on some of the changes that we believe are happening and um, why they're happening. And I'm gonna show you some uh, research we've done earlier this year on the impact of those changes. Um, and then I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Lorna, who's gonna take you through um, a case study, an award-winning case study of how we've actually put some of these strategies, strategies into action. Um, so really excited to share um, some of the tactics that we've used. As Ina said, the Q&A is open, so we'd be delighted to take some questions at the end. Um, also, I don't know what time it is for, for, for everyone who's, who's tuned in, um, but if it's past mid-morning, maybe, I've got a great drinking game for you. So um, grab your favorite drink, whether it's vodka, uh, or whiskey. We love a drinking game in Ireland, actually. Uh, so dry, grab your favorite drink. And any time me or Lorna say the word cookies, you need to take a shot of that drink. Uh, and then I'd love to see what kind of state you're all in by the end of the presentation. Um, so let's kick off. Um, I already alluded to the new era of digital marketing, but at Wolfgang, we firmly believe that we're now entering a, a new era of digital marketing. And um, that's going to accelerate over the next year, maybe a year and a half. What I mean by that is that digital marketing, as we know it, is fundamentally changing. Um, how we target users, how we measure results, really importantly, how we attribute value is beginning to look very different. Uh, and the next two years are gonna be an inflection point for us. Um, so it's really important that we're preparing ourselves, preparing our brands and preparing our clients for the new era of digital marketing to ensure that we're able to, to capitalize and continue to thrive in this new era. So when I think about the eras of digital marketing, I think of the initial era as being 2001 to 2015, represented by these two fresh-faced young go-getters. Um, many of you will recognize them as Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google. Um, so back in this initial era of digital marketing, one of the unique characteristics was that growth for big tech companies like Google or like Facebook uh, or like Amazon, that growth was largely being driven by internet adoption. So more people were using the internet, which meant growth for these companies was easier to come by, which meant that they didn't need to work that hard or they didn't need to compete that hard with each other to achieve growth, uh, which meant that they were quite transparent and very willing to share information with us. And um, so a lot of you might remember um, the level of keyword information we had. So if there's any SEOs tuned in, you, you might look back in the days when we could jump into Google Analytics and literally see what keywords were driving our organic traffic. Uh, I don't think we knew how good we had it back then. We also had a great level of detail on our referral traffic as well. Um, and depending on, on where you sit, um, this era of digital marketing was either the Wild West or it was the Golden Era. So we established Wolfgang Digital about 15 years ago. Um, so I very much see that era as being a golden era, mainly because I felt digital marketing leveled the playing field. What I mean by that was 
we work with a lot of companies uh, domestically in Ireland and internationally. But when we were starting out, we just work with small domestic companies in, in Ireland. Um, and we were able to allow those small companies compete at a global scale and compete with global brands simply by having a better paid search campaign than those global brands. So it was a great leveler. You could have a smarter digital marketing campaign and outsmart much larger players. Um, but things have changed over the last five years. Um, and that's mainly a function of the fact that growth is harder to come by for these big tech companies. Um, most people are, are on the internet now, so growth isn't coming from internet adoption. And that means that big tech companies like Google um, need to get a little bit more protective around the information that they share or the information that they're willing to share. And we've seen the impact of this as advertisers. So we've said goodbye to keyword level data in a lot of cases. We're now seeing a lot more or have been seeing a lot more dark traffic. So. What I mean by that is I'm sure you've all experienced jumping into Google Analytics and seeing a lot of direct traffic and then asking the question whether that traffic has been misattributed. And um, so Google isn't sharing exactly where that traffic is coming from. And um, we've also seen the rise of what we call no click search results. So the kind of informal contract we've always had with Google is, you know, sure, you can scrape our websites and you can take our content. Just please bring um, traffic to our website. Um, and no-click search results effectively mean that um, that's not happening, um, that Google are now answering the questions directly on the SERP, um, which is a little bit of a problem. Um, and the big change as well is that big tech now has monopolistic power, controlling 80% um, of web traffic. And we're going to see another big change coming down the line um, in 2023, which is the world's largest web browser, Google Chrome, will block third-party cookies. And just to underline how big it an update this is or how big a change this is. This was due to happen in 2022, um, but lots of people made lots of noise um, and not everything went according to plan for Google either. So they've pushed this out to 2023, um, which isn't that far away actually. Um, so a good strategy for people to start thinking about in preparation for this is that to recognize how reliant we've all been on using other people's data and to start think about how we might build our own data sources and leverage what we call first party data. And if that's something you're considering, um, and maybe you are if you're, you're attending this talk, you're in really good company. There was a great study carried out by Deloitte last year uh, where they showed that 61% um, of high growth brands were planning to invest in developing their first party data strategy, so are starting to invest in first party data. And um, so that's great. But a more interesting study for me came from DMXCO. And they were able to show us that less than 40% of international co companies had a solution figured out for first party data. So there's a little bit of a gap, you know, there's an appetite to do something on first party data, um, but then there's a gap between the wanting to do it and knowing how to execute um, and knowing how to actually develop a first party data strategy and run those campaigns. So hopefully that's what, what myself and Lorna are going to take you through to, to try and bridge that knowledge gap. Um, and if you do have a knowledge gap, you're, you're not alone. Um, there are lots of people who are who are still asking lots of questions. The biggest barrier at the moment um, on first party data is around education. And so lots of people talking about it, but still a gap when it comes to the execution. And um, so how do you actually go about doing this? And the reality is it's really important that we get this right um, as digital marketers. And if you're a digital marketer, congratulations, um, because you're the most valuable marketeer on the planet. Um, you've probably seen these stats like these over the last day or so, um, where digital is the, the lion share of global advertising spend. And it's estimated that come 2024, 70 cent in the euro or 70 cent in the dollar is going to be going online. So digital marketers are the most important marketeers on the planet. And that means that we've got a responsibility to make sure that we usher ourselves and our clients and our brands into the new era of digital marketing and continue to thrive. So what I want to do is I want to examine the changes that are happening through a couple of different lenses. So I want to have a look at what's driving the changes. Also want to have a look at what we think the impact on marketeers and brands is going to be. And then really importantly, we want to have a look at actions that you guys could take right now in anticipation for these changes. Um, quick caveat, um, some of you might be familiar with the, the concept of the black swan. It was a book by um, Nassim Nicholas Telab. And in the book, we're introduced to the concept of rare and unpredictable events. Um, 
And you might have heard people talk about known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Well, when it comes to, to the changes that are happening in digital right now, there are an awful lot of unknown unknowns. Um, I did a presentation on this, a similar topic last year, um, and I went back and had a look at my slides, and it was amazing how many of my slides had become obsolete because of changes that are ha have happened in less than 12 months. So it's great that you're attending this talk. I'd urge you to attend as many of these talks as you can and keep up to date yourself on what's happening because it's very much a dynamic situation. Um, so I'm sure everyone is familiar with, with what cookies are, what third-party cookies are, but let's very briefly explain. So they effectively track your behavior around the web like what websites you visit, what you bought, or maybe even what pages you've hit the, the Facebook like button on. And they were very much responsible for the shift from contextual targeting, um, where we had to put an ad in the context of the content, um, to interest-based advertising. So we cared less about the content and more about the individual. Um, so that gave rise to a, a whole area of targeted advertising or, or micro-targeting. But the reality was that Third-party cookies in particular, are they're a relic of the old internet. So they were designed at a time when we browsed the internet on our desktop computers. And um, user behavior has evolved an awful lot since then. And we use multiple devices, mainly this device right here. Um, and that was a real struggle for third-party cookies um, because they struggled to make the hop between devices. Um, so it really felt like user behavior had moved on and evolved beyond the capability of cookies. Um, beyond that, and third-party cookies fuel the whole industry of ad fraud. So there's lots of examples I could have pulled out here, um, but I've taken this example from the ex-CMO of Uber, and I've got a link to a, a fantastic podcast there that I'd urge you all to check out. Um, but within the podcast, he explains how Uber would defraud it um, for $100 million. Um, and really briefly, the way this worked was Uber's main KPI was to try and use their programmatic advertising to get people to install the app and take a one ride on the app, and that would be a conversion. Um, and this all started happening for them around the time when every brand was trying to ensure that their ads weren't appearing on the Breitbart website, and Uber were really struggling to ensure that that was happening. So they decided to, to pause 10% of their ad spend. And when they paused 10% of their ad spend, nothing happened to their conversions. So their internal team thought they were heroes. You know, they thought, wow, we can pause 10% of our ad spend and we're such a great brand that we continue to drive the same number of conversions. Um, but their CMO was like, no, this isn't good. This means we've been wasting money effectively. So let's dig a little bit deeper. And what they actually found was that what was happening was there's nefarious apps that people have downloaded on their phone over the years that fire cookies when somebody starts to search um, within the app store. So as soon as somebody typed in the letters UB in the app store, the cookie would fire to tell their programmatic advertiser that a conversion had happened. But in fact, not only had they not, a, not taken a ride with an Uber, they hadn't downloaded the app. They might not have even in installed the app. They might not have even searched for the Uber app. They might have been so searching for something else. So they estimated that over the years, they've been defrauded by a uh, hundred million. Um, beyond the fraud, though, platforms had already started blocking them. So Safari had been blocking third-party cookies since 2020. And that's significant. I always felt back in 2020, not enough noise was made about this. But Safari represents about 19% of global browser usage. Um, and then even users had started blocking them. So 27% of users in the US, 24% in the UK, for example, are already have taken action and started blocking third-party cookies. But what's happening now, though, the big change over the last year and a half is that we're entering an era um, when privacy meets platform. So the game was already up, um, but now that privacy concerns um, from users and from legislators are colliding with big tech platforms. And that means that Big tech is under the spotlight now more than ever as legislation is starting to catch up with them. Um, and we get to see these uh, fantastic Zoom calls. This must be the most expensive Zoom call in the history of the planet. Um, and when people think about privacy or they think about legislation, they'll often default to GDPR and they'll think about GDPR. But the reality is there's been a number of different legislations since this point. Um, and some of them have been as significant or even more significant than GDPR. In fact, we firmly believe at Wolfgang that um, privacy updates are the new algorithm updates. So if anyone on, uh, um, on the presentation is an SEO, you'll be very familiar with how much work SEOs put in to keep, 
keeping up to date with algorithm updates like Panda or Penguin. We believe that actually privacy updates have an even bigger impact um, on your life as a digital marketer. So it's really important that you're keeping up to date with what those changes are. Um, so although big tech is under the spotlight from lots of different angles, the ad business that they've built is too valuable for them to let any pesky legislators get in the way. Um, so we showed you how digital represents 60% of total global advertising spend. Well, the duopoly of Facebook and Google um, command about two thirds of that. And they make 95% of their revenues um, from advertising. So they're going to work really hard to protect that ad business. So for me then, it does really make me look at the changes that Google are proposing to Chrome and, and ask the question, is this a, a genuine move towards a more private web? Or is it somehow a terrifying transfer of power back to big tech? Um, and another question that it poses is, well, will anything replace third party cookies? Um, and there's lots of people asking this question and there's lots of stakeholders that are gonna be impacted here. Um, so you might've seen this image before, but it's a um, horrible representation of just the size of the marketing tech ecosystem. So there's over 8,000 marketing tech companies represented here. Lots of them have built their business and are reliant on third party cookies. And um, so lots of people wondering what will replace the third party cookie. But the reality is Google were pretty explicit and um, when they made their initial announcements that they were going to get rid of third party cookies. And um, so this came for their, their head of product in ad privacy and trust. And you can see what he said was today, we're making it explicit that once third party cookies are phased out, we will not build alternative identifiers um, to track individuals as they browse across our web, um, nor will we use them in our products. So that's pretty explicit. Um, it doesn't look like there's going to be a like-for-like -like replacement of third-party cookies. And we still don't really know what new targeting is going to look like. A lot of people, including me, got excited about Google's Flock proposal last year. Um, it's a terrible name. It stands for the Federated Learning of Cohorts. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to understand it and talking to clients about what the new world might look like, uh, and it didn't work out for Google. Some people felt that it wasn't privacy protecting enough. Um, so. I'm a little bit hesitant to go into too much detail on their current proposal, which is called topics, because that might change. But in any case, nothing will replace a third party cookie. What will ultimately happen is there will be a way to target cohorts of users, but it'll be broader than the targeting that's available now. And what that means for, for us is that the walls around the gardens um, of Google and Facebook are getting higher. So these are the biggest first party uh, data gardens on the planet and those walls are going up. Um, so that could have a, a real impact on advertisers and it's worth considering that impact. Um, and we'll often think about it across three main categories um, that are gonna be impacted, which is our ability to target users, our ability to measure results, and then our ability to attribute um, those results. Um, but we've had a, an amazing glimpse into a world without third-party cookies, thanks to Apple. Because last year, in April of last year, um, Apple released the iOS 14.5 update. And that effectively required users to opt in to being tracked. Um, and this is really significant, uh, particularly given that um, globally, um, I We did our own research uh, over the last few months to try and understand what impact did this have on our clients. And um, so we had a look across, we've over 100 clients, we had a look across all their data. And what we found was post the iOS 14.5 update, there was a 29% reduction in Facebook traffic coming from uh, iPhones. That's a, a very significant reduction in the amount of traffic coming from a particular advice, from coming from a particular device. I think the assumption a lot of people made was, well, we can make up that traffic from Android. And in some cases you can, but there's been another impact, which is that CPCs have rose. So cost per clicks have doubled over the course of the year. And Wolfgang weren't the only organization to recognize this. This is some additional independent research from Amplify. And what's happening here is that Advertisers who are still trying to target people on a niche basis have a smaller pool of a target, targetable audience. And that means there's more advertisers trying to target a smaller audience, which means the way the auction will ultimately work is that cost per clicks um, will increase. So it's getting more expensive. And this is a bit of a double whammy as well for advertisers because 
as part of our research, we also were able to reveal that iPhone users were more valuable. They effectively spent 26% more than Android users. So now we can't niche target this audience. It's getting more expensive to target any audience and actually we're losing out on a high value audience. The other thing that's been seriously impacted is attribution. Things were already messy when it came to attribution. And this is a great example, and I'm sure lots of you will have experienced this in your day-to-day -day as a digital marketer, where Facebook is telling us that this campaign generated nearly 70,000 euro, and Google Analytics is saying, nope, it's uh, 15,000 euro. So that gap is only going to widen. So that begs the question, what should you prioritize now as a digital marketer in preparation for further changes that are coming and in preparation for the end of third-party cookies in Chrome? Well, I think we've all recognized over the last year and a half that we were very reliant on using big text data um, and they're, they're are using other people's data. And that one of the steps that we can take um, or one of the most sustainable steps we can take is to start to look at building out our own first-party data. Um, so if third-party cookies are going away, a great sustainable investment is to start to look at how you can build your own data sources. So at Wolfgang, when we talk about first-party data, we really talk about it across two main buckets. Um, your business data, a lot of people undervalue the power of business data, but your business data is unique to you and it can be leveraged within your digital marketing activities. So these can be things like your profit margin um, or maybe your returns information uh, or maybe even exchange rates across countries that you're applying. And um, so that's business data that's unique to you. And then another really valuable bucket of first party data is obviously so things like your email addresses, lifetime value, and maybe customer surveys um, that you've carried out. The new targeting landscape is going to look something like this. So as advertisers, we'll select the platforms that work best for our brands, and then we'll overlay our business data and overlay our customer data um, to get incrementally better performance. And investing in building out your, your understanding of your customers or building out your customer data is a great sustainable investment. And I love this quote from Steve Jobs who says, get closer than ever to your customers, so close that you tell them what they need well before they realize it themselves. So irrespective of what changes are coming down the line from Google or what changes are coming down the line from Facebook or Amazon or any of the big tech platforms, investing in understanding your customers more or building out your own customer information is gonna be a sustainable investment that will work across your business, not just within your digital marketing. But if you are looking to, to leverage your first party data within digital marketing, a great place to start is using an e um, We carry out um, regular KPI studies in Wolfgang. They're available on our website, actually, on the blog if you want to check them out. But every year, um, like every year, we're always surprised at how well email correlates with revenue growth. Um, and that's been the case for the last three or four years. Um, so leveraging your first party data with an email is a great way to get started on a first party data strategy. And if you're not running an email, email activity at the moment, or if email isn't a channel that you've used, it means that you get to add another channel to your digital marketing mix. Um, and there's lots of studies that have shown a correlation between increasing the number of channels or the platforms that you use and incremental ROI. Um, so this is one study, I know Mark, Mark Ritson is, was involved in this, but it shows that as we add more channels to our digital marketing campaign, uh, our digital marketing mix, um, we, can effectively, um, we can effectively increase the incremental ROI. So that's enough from me. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Lorna, who's going to take you through how we've been using a first party data strategy, what it looks like in Wolfgang, and then how we've executed it on a client accounts to get um, record breaking uh, revenue increases. Thanks so much, Brendan. Just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So um, as Brendan has shown, and um, you know, this privacy first world comes with a lot of unknowns, but one thing which is certain is that reducing your reliance on third party data or rented audiences uh, from third party platforms like Google, like Facebook, and developing your own first party data opens up many opportunities for you. And um, so I'm going to take you through some of the many um, benefits of using first party data. 
So the first benefit is around personalization and integration. So by ensuring each channel is either using or gathering first party data, you can create a really personalized experience for your customers online. Uh, the next benefit is reaching the right customers. So your paid channels have massive reach, but we want to ensure we're reaching the right people. So building your segments post-click using first-party data rather than pre-click using third-party data allows you to get more grander with your targeting. And next one is privacy. Uh, so transparency is key in this new era. So it's really important to share why, when, and how personal data will be used when you collect it. Uh, the last one here uh, is around accuracy and strength strengthening customer relationships. So since you own this data, you have more control over how it's collected and managed, giving you greater assurances over data usage. So all of these benefits combined allow you to create a really strengthened uh, relationship with your customers online. So here at Wolfgang, we've actually created our own uh, four stage first party data approach. And I'm gonna take you through each of those stages of the approach now. Uh, so to begin, it's important to scope out your needs. So firstly, identify your goal. How much uh, would you like to grow your first party data year on year? And what incremental gains do you expect to see from activating it? Then you need to think about the data you are currently collecting and what additional data you'd like to start collecting. So for example, in the past, you might have relied on Google uh, to overlay demographic data. So if this is the case, and this is something that you might consider collecting on your own website forms. Next, look at the qualitative and quantitative data you have on your loyal customers to establish what value exchange or what type of incentive um, are they really going to engage with. And then that's going to be the basis for the incentive to build out your subscriber list. So now that you have a plan of action, the next step is to start actually building your first party data. So what you want to do is turn those rented audiences from paid channels into your owned audiences. Uh, so here you want to ask yourself two key questions. So at each stage of the funnel, what data would I like to start collecting and how should I go about collecting that data? So this will differ for every business, but we've outlined uh, some examples here. So take a look at them and try to identify um, some options that you can actually start leveraging now. Um, here at Wolfgang, we actually uh, recommend progressive profiling. Uh, so asking for all of that first party data upfront with a big lengthy form on your website is just going to scare your prospects away. So collect the most essential first party data at the start of the funnel and then the least essential at the end. So at the awareness stage, uh, you want to ensure you're collecting the golden nugget of data, which is the email address, as all other touch points will link back to that unique customer ID, which is the email address. Then at the loyalty stage, you can collect the least essential, but still beneficial first party data. Uh, so this could be something like a survey, for example. So at the segment stage, you should be collecting first party data at different stages of the funnel from various different sources. All of this data, and most importantly, the email address should all be funneling into your CRM platform. So make sure all those forms um, are integrated with your CRM platform and that all that data is automatically being uploaded uh, to the platform. Uh, and so to really activate this data, uh, you should build out segments that allow you to personalize the next steps after that. So for example, if you're collecting uh, new subscriber details from different locations around Europe, you should have segments built out to trigger a series of emails that are personalized to their location or to their language. Then you want to also ensure you have segments built out for your pay channels. So for example, you could create a segment um, overlaying that demographic data that you've collected and then plug it into your ad platforms and create lookalike audiences. So build out the various segments you need to get smarter with your targeting and personalization, and then plug these audiences into your email workflows and your PPC and social ad campaigns. So finally, we have the activation stage. So here we're looking at your digital marketing campaigns across each channel and ensuring first party data is the thread that stitches all of your channels together. Uh, so we look at it like a virtuous cycle. Um, and we've shared a graph here of how it all works together with a social um, and email integrated campaign. 
So at the top, um, you have the uh, creating a compelling incentive piece. So this attracts subscribers, um, which are then fed into your CRM platform. Then these subscribers fall into the relevant segments that we discussed, and then they're triggered emails or ads, depending on their stage of the journey. Um, and then the idea is once you've kind of run a campaign like that, you then pull all the insights. So all of that qualitative and quantitative data, you pull those insights and use those insights to strengthen the scope stage. So you're continuously strengthening uh, your campaigns with first party data. And um, so essentially every stage feeds into and powers the next stage of the cycle. So now you know the Wolfgang first party data approach. Let's look at all of that in action. So we're going to uh, take you through a global award winning case study uh, from one of our clients, Body Slims. So Body Slims, they sell wellness and fitness programs. Um, and what we did was by putting first party data first, we were able to drive 1 million in sales in five months, more than the 12 months, um, the previous 12 months combined. So prior to the last year, Body Slims relied heavily on third party retargeting uh, to drive bookings. So we wanted to get Body Slims ahead of their competitors and create a future proof first party data strategy that didn't rely on third party retargeting. So integration was key here. So this needed to be a fully integrated campaign that used first party data at every stage of the funnel. And it involved a multitude of Wolfgang channels. And as Brendan previously uh, highlighted with the synergies of integration graph, um, the, the higher return investment you can expect uh, to see um, when you integrate all your channels. So the more channels that are integrated, the higher return on investment you can expect to see. And that's exactly what we, we witnessed with uh, Body Sims. So as a team, we kick things off by establishing our objectives with the clients. So the first objective was to grow their email list by 100% year on year. The second objective was to increase online revenue by 40% year on year. And at this stage, we also defined the different types of first party data we wanted to collect. So our first uh, step to executing this strategy was to create some content that we could use as a lead magnet in the build stage to grow our email list. So we leveraged the insights collected from existing first party data touch points. The first one was a uh, website blog engagement. So we noticed that food and recipe content drove 2.8 times more engagement than other types of content. So this was our first key insight to building their value exchange, AKA their, their incentive to collecting subscribers. We also leveraged first party data from our social channels. So we noticed that our recipe focused ads performed incredibly well. And the comment section on these types of posts were the most engaging with brand advocates sharing uh, reviews. So this allowed us to establish the type of content for our value exchange, which was gonna be recipes. We also looked at other first party daddy insights we had. So one being this interactive landing page we created in the midst of lockdown. So visitors to the site were encouraged to click on how they were feeling that day um, and they were presented with empathetic content related to that emotion. So what we discovered was that stress and anxiety were prevalent emotions amongst our audience. So given those insights, we knew that our value exchange would focus on recipe content, but also trying to find ways to reduce stress levels. We then looked into wrapping all of those insights into a compelling piece of content. Um, which was our value exchange. Um, and we actually saw that Body Slims had created a recipe landing page on the website the previous summer that didn't actually get much traction. It was full of recipes from hotter climates in Europe. So we packaged these low calorie recipes from different countries into an ebook to use as our incentive to sign up for email. And we felt that this would be a valuable incentive to offer in exchange for collecting subscribers, given those kind of initial insights we had around uh, the engagement on, on recipe content. So the next step was to get the ebook live across all um, our various touch points um, and then to actually start building out the email list. So we created an embedded form on the homepage, a pop up form, and then we had embedded forms on all the relevant uh, blog posts. And, and then all of these forums were personalized to call out our incentive, which was this ebook. And by far, our biggest reach was on social with the lead gen campaign targeting uh, the right audience. Um, and then lastly, knowing the loyalty of Body Slim's existing customers, 
we sent the ebook to them via email and encouraged them to forward it on to family and friends, um, which helped us increase the overall subscriber rate. So these new subscribers were then all automatically uploaded uh, to Body Slim's CRM platform, which was Constant Contact. So we built lookalike audiences ahead of the prospecting stage using Body Slim's existing email lists on both Facebook and Google Ads. Um, and this is a great example um, of how you can use your existing first party data at every stage of the funnel, even for prospecting. But once you have uploaded your list and it's GDPR compliant, uh, there are loads of innovative ways in which you can actually start to leverage it. So on Facebook and YouTube in the prospecting stage, we started building audiences to bring down the funnel by promoting awareness video content to warm people up to the brand. And it's important to note here that as these audience are, are built on the platform, they don't require any cookie tracking. So after people had been warmed up to the brand, we started promoting the Facebook lead gen campaign. Uh, for this, we promoted a really simple single image asset that you can see here. And once a user clicked on the ad, they entered their details into the form. And then this data was funneled directly into Constant Contact. So while CRM platforms, um, most of them can integrate directly with Facebook, with Google, uh, some aren't compatible. Uh, so in this case, uh, we used a tool called Zapier to plug our CRM directly into Facebook. So this allowed us to send our leads from Facebook directly to the designated list we created in our CRM. Uh, this tool is also really handy to plug all your other channels into. So uh, Google um, as well can work here. Um, and it created a really streamlined process for us. So I showed you this slide um, as I was taking you through the Wolfgang first party data approach to explain how it's important to build out your first party data at each of the stages of the funnel. So I just wanted you to cast your eyes over it again, but this time with examples of how we collected first party data at each stage for body sims. So at the awareness stage, um, I just mentioned a few different types of forms we use to collect data. And um, so I've listed them here. Then at the interest stage, we collected data points from website interactions and engagement with email campaigns. And then at the action stage, we used booking history. So for example, we created segments of customers who had booked in for one or more programs in the last year, but who had not yet booked for the next program. And we could use this data to target them with personalized messaging around the benefits of being a repeat participant. Then finally, at the loyalty stage, we used surveys as part of a series of emails. So after we had sent them the ebook, we would then send them a survey uh, which allowed us to collect qualitative data to ensure the next few ebooks that we sent them were focused on content uh, that customers actually wanted to see. Uh, so you can see here the many ways in which you can build out and enrich your existing uh, first party data. So we then created various segments within Constant Contact depending on sign up source. Uh, we had different segments set up for uh, workflows and for paid targeting campaigns. Uh, we integrated the first party data segments with Google and Facebook uh, to maximize personalization and profitability. Um, the, so what we did was create um, email lookalike audiences and they performed almost as well as our retargeting audiences, showing how effective first party data is at all stages of the funnel. We sent uh, triggered emails immediately after someone signed up for their copy of the ebook. This email was the first in a series and it welcomed them to the community and shared relevant information that was personalized to them. And so as part of this triggered email, we also had interactive elements. Um, so these play, so we actually had countdown clocks and we had um, playlists. So these playlists could be paired with a recipe from each country and played for the duration of, of cooking time. So for example, if you were trying out a Greek recipe, uh, you could pop on a Greek playlist and let the music from the country and the smells in your kitchen create a really immersive experience. So we knew uh, that the lockdown had you know, taken a toll from our, our qualitative and quantitative insights we had. Um, and we knew that people were itching to get away um, on a sun break. So we tried to create that holiday atmosphere for them at home. So after receiving the first email, they then received a series of emails tailored based on where they were in the funnel. Uh, so the series began with more educational emails and then led into more action-led book now emails. 
And we didn't just nurture these leads on email, we also show them content on social, um, such as recipes and blog posts, um, all again, which were insights driven. And this created a really nice cross-channel uh, content journey where users were learning about body slims at multiple digital touch points. So once these leads had been nurtured over a period of time, we started running a Facebook conversion campaign and the same on Google. We also aligned and integrated our messaging across channels. So users were targeted uh, with the same types of messages on each channel. So you can see here, we had a countdown clock on email and we emulated that and used the countdown clock on social as well. So that is the case study. Uh, hopefully you can see from uh, this case study that an integrated strategy allowed um, us to seamlessly nurture our audience towards conversion. Um, and we, you know, the results show that we did just that. Uh, we grew the email list by 540% year on year, and we increased online revenue by 174% year on year, which was four times our target of 40%. Each channel saw an increase in revenue year on year. Um, and we did this by making first party data the core element of our campaign. So uh, here's a testimonial from the client. Uh, so you can read it there. Um, essentially, um, you know, what, what uh, the client um, came away with, with saying was, you know, Wolfgang turned what was an extremely challenging time into a success story, not only maintaining our growth, uh, but more than doubling it year on year. So we uh, effectively future proof BodySlim's entire digital marketing strategy. We arm them with a process to continue to build and activate this data, regardless of changes in the privacy and cookie landscape. So with that, I encourage you to approach your first party data strategy head on um, with these recommendations that we've taken you through. And to end, I'll leave you with this great quote from Jeff Bezos, um, which might give you some food for thought on this new era of digital marketing. So when trends emerge, businesses have a choice, embrace them and have a tailwind, fight them and you're probably fighting the future. So that was everything from us. Thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I think we have a couple of minutes now to take some questions. Yes. Um, uh, we do have one question from uh, Rimente. He says, uh, what she says, sorry, what's a good and bad email open rate approximately? Uh, of course, it varies depending on the niche, etc." Yeah, no, that's, um, yeah, I get asked that question a lot. And I think it's difficult to answer because again, it's dependent on the industry. Uh, it's also dependent on the size of your list. So there's so many factors that impact your open rate. But what I would recommend uh, you do is have a look at, there's lots of benchmarks out there. So there's lots of, um, like, for example, um, Brendan mentioned that we have our own KPI reports where we look at certain averages. Open rate is one of, uh, we don't actually look at that uh, in detail, but I know that, uh, for example, like Campaign Monitor, they bring out a yearly um, open rate benchmarks for each industry. So that's mm -hmm. a really good one to look at. Um, and Litmus also, they bring out one every year. So I'd have a look at the industry benchmarks that they see. Um, and also actually your, um, your CRM platform. So whatever platform you're using, so whether it's MailChimp, Constant Contact, they also have their own benchmarks that they get from you know, the multitude of, of um, customers that they have. So there's lots of different areas in which you can, you can pull an average. But yes, I, I can't give you an exact, you know, a really good open rate. You'd have to, to look at it based on, based on your industry. S sometimes as well, open rate is maybe the wrong metric to look at. Like we we'd always mm -hmm. advise our clients to look further down the funnel and just see like what, what like what? Well, like what's the purpose of the email marketing strategy and it's it's rarely just to get people to read the emails you know in often cases it's to get them to the website or to get them to make a purchase or to get them to take an action and um, so you might be able to tolerate a lower open rate um if the the action that you're optimizing towards whether it's a conversion is is mm -hmm. where it needs to be if you know what i mean it's kind of like that um it's kind of like looking at click-through rate on paid search ads you know we've kind of moved away from that a little bit as long as we're getting the ROAS and hitting the revenue figure we don't care too much what the what the click-through there's a great signal for for doing some small ops but really what we want to look at is that 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 real value that conversion value yeah all right i think with that we're done with the session thank you very much everyone do not forget to rate the session and check the rest of the schedule for the conference thanks again brendan and uh, yeah Thanks a million, Inez. Thank yeah. so Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks again, Lorna.
All right.